In Texas, an unsuspecting federal agent is abducted at gunpoint. The men responsible escape unseen into the vast South Texas terrain. Valuable minutes pass before the lawman's disappearance is discovered. With the life of one of their own in jeopardy, his colleagues are determined. They will find the suspects, bring them in, and make them pay. victim of a violent crime is a member of law enforcement, the job of investigating becomes personal. At a United States border crossing, armed fugitives kidnapped a customs inspector, then vanished. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Desperate to find their colleague, local, state, and federal authorities waged a full-scale manhunt in Texas and in Mexico. Racing against the clock, they hoped their resolve would make the difference. Authorities at the U.S. port of entry at Del Rio, Texas, see hundreds of legal crossings between the United States and Mexico every day. But they also see an average of $250 million in confiscated drugs all manner of criminal activities, and thousands of illegal immigrants every year. The men and women of U.S. Customs know the threat of danger is always present. Hiding behind the throng of harmless civilians are criminals who view them as the enemy. On the afternoon of January 27, 1984, a vehicle with Texas plates pulled up to the port's primary checkpoint. Customs inspector Jose Torres asked the occupants for identification. The three passengers provided green cards showing they were legal resident aliens allowed to work in the U.S. The driver explained he was an American citizen, but produced only a baptismal certificate as proof. Inspector Torres could not accept it. Logging in the car's license plate, he ordered the driver to a secondary checkpoint for further verification. The vehicle was met by customs inspector Richard Latham. Hello, man. Baptismal certificate? A 10 year veteran at the border. It was his job to handle questionable persons or vehicles. Oh, me. Latham brought the driver inside to speak with an officer of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. The INS officer chastised the driver over his insufficient papers. Since the man claimed he was a US citizen, born and raised in El Paso, the officer interrogated him on details only a resident could know. In minutes, the man's detailed answers persuaded the official that his lack of paperwork was his only indiscretion. The driver was cleared, but Latham still had to inspect the vehicle. Stand over there. To look inside your car. Following routine procedure, he checked for illegal drugs or undeclared contraband. 
Since there was nothing suspicious about the men or their behavior, Inspector Latham was alone during the search. To everyone working at the port that day, it seemed like every other day. Then, at about 4.45 in the afternoon, a detective with the Del Rio, Texas police arrived. He informed border officials that a jewelry store had been robbed 15 minutes earlier in the Mexican border town of Ciudad Acuna, two miles away. His information was unfortunately sketchy, but he said Mexican police were searching for four Hispanic males, at least one of whom could speak English. The police and border officials went immediately to alert each of the inspectors on duty. Since the robbers might try to enter the United States, inspections at the primary checkpoints were doubled. Good afternoon. How are you heading? Customs officials wanted to be certain that no one connected to the robbery would enter the country. Yes, Got anything to declare? Okay. But at around five o'clock, uh, Inspector Torres received disturbing news. Customs Inspector Richard Latham was missing. Del Rio Detective John Martin was at the port that day. For him to just suddenly disappear, we knew something was wrong. Although the time of the disappearance marked a shift change, Latham had not followed the required protocol for leaving his post. He had not left in his own vehicle. He had not checked out and told anyone else that he was leaving. And the standard procedure for those inspectors, even if they were rotating off for a uh, coffee break or to go to the restroom, would have been to have notified uh, other inspectors at the port. None of this had occurred. Their only conclusion was Inspector Latham had been kidnapped. Our first investigative response was to determine when Inspector Latham had last been seen and what he had been doing. Customs Inspector Torres reported seeing Latham searching an older model vehicle at the secondary checkpoint. He described the car as a gray, late 1970s Pontiac Grand Prix with three or four Hispanic males standing alongside who matched the jewelry thieves wanted by Mexican police. The inspector described the driver as a male in his 20s, wearing an El Paso baseball cap. Torres realized that as he turned to check the next vehicle, Inspector Latham must have discovered something. And the kidnappers struck, then escaped the port unseen. U.S. Customs Service Special Agent Dennis Harlan helped lead the search for Latham. It was a race against time. It's been my experience that if an officer is taken at gunpoint, he is eventually killed. Everyone knew the window of opportunity to rescue the kidnapped officer was short. They sprang into action. A customs officer retrieved the computer list of all license plates that passed through the Del Rio port into the US between 4.15 and 5 p.m., about the time Latham disappeared. The list was less than 100 vehicles, but it did not contain the owner's names and addresses. For that information, they had to access the Department of Motor Vehicles database. Hindered by 1980s computer technology, it would take valuable time to accomplish. Del Rio police began creating a composite likeness using an identikit. Based on Inspector Torres and other witnesses' recollections, pre-drawn facial features merged piece by piece into an image of the driver. When the composite image was complete, investigators sent it to every local, state, and federal police agency in the area. Police units fanned out in search of a gray Grand Prix. Investigators now had a possible likeness of the driver but nothing specific on the passengers. Custom Service helicopters supported the ground units in the search. But with few leads, they knew finding the men in the Texas backcountry would be difficult. 
One and a half hours had lapsed since Latham disappeared. A car traveling at an inconspicuous 55 miles per hour could be anywhere within 20,000 square miles. The search area was enormous. And with each minute, it got even larger. In record time, the DMV database returned the list of license plate numbers with the owner's names and addresses. There were eight Pontiac Grand Prix on the list. Police officers went to the six addresses in Del Rio to investigate the vehicles. But two were registered to owners in El Paso, where the driver of the suspect vehicle said he lived, and that was 10 hours away. A customs agent contacted the nearest FBI field office to seek their help and informed Special Agent Don Weatherman about the kidnapping. It was very discouraging to realize that we had a missing customs inspector, no trace of where he might be, what happened to him, um, and so very little information other than the fact that he was last seen doing his job and uh, no one knew or seen anything of him uh, since that time. The customs agent asked Weatherman to direct the field agent in El Paso to track down the two registered Grand Prix. FBI Special Agent Charles Riley was assigned to interview the owners of the cars. But at both residences, the vehicles were missing and no one was home. Agent Riley theorized that the registration information he received may have been outdated. He returned to the El Paso FBI office determined to find the cars and their owners. That evening, I had the, uh, the clerk in the office conduct further license checks on the two vehicle uh, license plates, trying to come up with the actual owners of the vehicles at the current time. It would take hours to cross-reference the data. Much of it would be done by hand. State and local police manned roadblocks in every direction from the port. Where you going? You got any ID? All vehicles leaving the area were stopped and searched. When the San Antonio FBI agents arrived in Del Rio, they were briefed on the latest developments of the search. Despite the efforts of dozens of cooperating law enforcement agencies, they had come up with nothing. Nearly seven hours had passed since Inspector Richard Latham was abducted. By the end of the first night's investigation, there were still no promising leads. You always hope that they'll turn them loose, but history doesn't, doesn't prove that out. Um, so basically, we knew we were looking for a body after probably late that evening, you know. The full-scale search was still ongoing the next morning. Fixed-wing aircraft, which could travel faster and farther than helicopters, widened the search perimeter to cover the vast Texas brush. Texas state troopers continued their roadblocks in the area surrounding Del Rio. Oh, how you doing today, man? Where you headed? Although by that time, they knew the suspects were likely gone. In El Paso, Special Agent Riley eliminated as suspects an elderly couple who owned a gray Pontiac Grand Prix. But the other owner sold his vehicle to a man by the name of Ricardo Cortez. Cortez had failed to register the vehicle in his name. A background check showed Ricardo Cortez had a criminal record for drug possession. Riley located his most current address. I went to that address, spoke with Cortez's mother, 
uh, and determined that he had been out of town for three or four days. She was not sure when he was going to be back. She stated that uh, Cortez still owned the car in question and had the car with him. I went to the El Paso Police Department and obtained a photograph of Cortez and wired a copy to the, uh, the port of entry in Del Rio, Texas. Cortez looked similar to the composite of the driver. Finally, agents had their first suspect, something specific they could move on in hopes of finding Richard Latham and the men who abducted him. But as their hopes rose, 50 miles away, a man collecting firewood near Eagle Pass, Texas, made a grisly discovery. The body of a man wearing a U.S. customs uniform. Come on, step over here, please. In Del Rio, Texas, authorities believe jewelry thieves crossing the border in a gray Pontiac Grand Prix abducted U.S. Customs Inspector Richard Latham. Investigators identified the driver of the car as Ricardo Cortez, who had been missing since Latham's disappearance. But even as they got that first real lead, they learned the body of a man wearing a U.S. Customs uniform was discovered in a ditch off Highway 277 near Eagle Pass, Texas. Local officers secured the scene but decided nobody would enter until the FBI arrived. While agents at the Del Rio port of entry boarded a helicopter for the 60-mile flight to Eagle Pass, Texas state troopers continued to man roadblocks throughout the area. The kidnappers were now most likely gone, but no one could be certain. Though frustrated, trooper Art Corral, who worked the road from Del Rio to El Paso, was not going to give up the search. We were out there for hours uh, checking cars and on the roadblock, and, you know, it seemed like nothing was, we weren't going to get anywhere. That our supervisor advised to go ahead and stay on that road, but break off the roadblock. So, in part, I decided to stop cars that had three or more uh, Latin males in the car. About that time, we saw this car go by, and there were three people in the car. However unlikely, the men inside might be connected to the abduction. The driver got out and approached the troopers. How you doing, sir? How you been? Corral explained why he had pulled him over. Four mil Hispanic subjects are involved in kidnapping. The driver gave his ID. He was a taxi driver from Eagle Pass, hired by the men in his car to take them to Presidio, Texas. He admitted he was glad to be pulled over. His passengers were agitated and made him nervous. They want me to take them from Intonal to Pass. The trooper decided to run a check on them. How you doing, guys? Give us your IDs, please. He got the green cards of the two passengers, Rafael Calderon and Jesus Ramirez. Neither of them fit the description of the suspect driver of the Grand Prix, and there were only two of them. Determined to be thorough, Trooper Corral and his partner would run a check on the names just in case. Inside the car, Corral's partner tried to radio dispatch. Any other station out there can hear me? You can copy me. Please answer. But there was no signal. He tried again. Still, nothing. It's common around that area to lose contact. You had a lot of valleys and peaks. And sometimes you would lose contact with the, with the radio station. You'd have to move location in order to make contact with one of our stations. 
he took down the passenger's information to call in from a different position. How much to pay you? Tell you what, sir. Here's your ID card. Follow me back to the vehicle, okay? They believe they could afford the risk of letting the car go. Out here, there's only one road. You may not have another road for 100 miles. So when you let a car go, you know, for whatever reason, and you uh, and something comes up, you probably have a good chance of finding them again. The troopers took the chance and doubled back to catch a radio signal. By 2.15, FBI agents arrived in Eagle Pass to process the scene where the body was discovered. Everyone working the case had hoped they would find their fellow lawman alive. But the evidence was clear. It was Richard Latham. The inspector had been bound by his own handcuffs and shot twice in the back. The kidnappers were now cop killers. U.S. Customs Agent Dennis Harlan was distraught over the loss of his friend. Yeah, we lost one of ours. One of brother officer has been taken and murdered. And uh, uh, those of us that have been in the field, we take that personally. And I was sorry that Richard was dead, but in a criminal investigation of this nature, finding of the body is very, very important. The body becomes evidence. So I felt a sense of relief that we had found the body sense of sadness that uh, a friend of mine was gone. Examiners would determine he had been shot with a 38 caliber handgun, the same as his service weapon, which was missing. For Del Rio detective John Martin, the execution style murder shed a chilling light on the type of criminal they were after. Someone that has the temerity to kidnap a law enforcement officer and to subsequently murder that officer, knowing the response that you're going to receive. Um, that is the most dangerous type of individual. That means they don't take anyone's life in, in any regard whatsoever, and they would kill the average person on the street in a moment. Troopers kept trying the radio. After several minutes, they made contact. Uh, you're going to make it ahead. Yes, I need uh, 329 checks on three subjects. Dispatch officers ran checks on the men in the taxi. They came back with a return and said there was a possible hit on one of the passengers, which uh, was Ramirez in the back seat. There was an outstanding DUI warrant for a Jesus Ramirez. It might not be the same Ramirez, but the troopers needed to verify his identity. So we decided to go ahead and, and try to catch up to the car. Fortunately, the taxi was still on the highway. The driver pulled over for a second time. Trooper Corral cleared the driver and approached the vehicle to speak to Jesus Ramirez. I start yelling for the guy in the back seat. Then I need to talk to him to come on out. At this time, I see uh, I see the passenger kind of slouched in the back seat and he's moving around. You know, I can see his head and shoulders kind of squirming in the back seat. So I keep calling him back, and uh, all of a sudden. While investigating a federal officer's abduction, Texas state troopers pulled a car over to question a man inside. Put your 
But the traffic stop quickly turned dangerous for Trooper Art Corral and his partner. When the shot was fired, my partner reached for the shotgun, and we didn't have time to call anybody. Uh, you know, it was just us two. And when there's a shooting, you got to react quickly, you know, because that, that could mean life or death. Put your hands in the back. Give me the one. With his partner covering him, Corral got Rafael Calderon out of the vehicle and into custody. He placed him behind the squad car, away from any weapons. Get on down, get on down, get on down. Then they went to check on the man in the back seat. Jesus Ramirez had shot himself in the head with a 357. The troopers recovered that weapon and a 38 caliber revolver. Now they needed to know why the traffic stop turned deadly. One trooper retrieved Ramirez's identification and a piece of paper from his jacket, while the other removed Rafael Calderon's belongings. Any guns on you? No. All you got? Including a large knife and a cloth bag. Get a car. Corral suspected that Ramirez would not have killed himself over a DUI warrant. He knew there had to be another motive. The troopers called in the incident and learned that Latham's body had been discovered. Customs agents in the FBI believed the highway shooting was connected to the Latham case and flew to the scene. When they arrived, they reviewed the evidence. Along with the 357 Ramirez used to kill himself was a 38 caliber handgun, a service revolver later determined to be Inspector Richard Latham's, the gun that killed him. In the pillowcase taken off Calderon, they discovered tens of thousands of dollars of jewelry that matched the items stolen during the robbery in Mexico. They also found a handwritten bill of sale for a 1975 Pontiac Grand Prix taken from the dead man's jacket. The seller's name was Ricardo Cortez the first suspect identified hours earlier. Now with Rafael Calderon in custody, it was time to get some answers. On the way back to Del Rio, FBI Special Agent Moses Alanez interrogated Calderon. I was in the back seat, a uh, ranger's vehicle. On the way, uh, Mr. Calderon began relating to me what had transpired uh, the previous two days uh, from the point that they left uh, uh, El Paso, uh, himself and, and three other friends, into Mexico. Calderon claimed that Jesus Ramirez planned the robbery. He said Ramirez picked the jewelry store in Mexico, believing it was easier to get away with armed robbery there than in the U.S. While Calderon, Ramirez, and a third man he knew only as Carlos robbed the place, their driver, Ricardo Cortez, waited in the getaway car. They took as much as they could grab in a few minutes. Then left. Calderon said they headed for the border, crossing at Del Rio. Everything seemed fine when Cortez passed the INS interview and the customs inspector searched the trunk.
look in your car. They began to get nervous when he checked the back seat. He found the bag of stolen jewelry, so Ramirez pulled a gun. As they left the port, Cortez, a man named Carlos, took the inspector's service revolver and secured him with his own handcuffs. According to Calderon, Jesus Ramirez was in charge the entire time. He decided the inspector had seen too much. They had to get rid of him. Calderon said he and Ramirez forced Latham into the ditch. He claimed it was Ramirez who shot the inspector twice in the back with his own service revolver. After leaving the customs inspector to die, the men continued to Eagle Pass where they crossed the border back into Mexico. At a motel there, they went through the jewelry, putting the most valuable pieces into pillowcases. The plan was then to separate. Calderon and Ramirez would take the jewelry back into the United States. Ricardo Cortez and Carlos were supposed to keep the car in Mexico for a few days. They would all meet later in El Paso. The agent noted that during Calderon's version of events, he repeatedly named Ramirez as the trigger man. As the suspect was taken to jail in Del Rio, agents reviewed the facts of their case. Rafael Calderon was in custody. According to him, the shooter was Jesus Ramirez, who had killed himself at the traffic stop. The driver of the Grand Prix Latham searched was Ricardo Cortez of El Paso. The fourth suspect was a man Calderon knew only as Carlos. He and Ricardo Cortez were still at large. Customs Special Agent Dennis Harlan was determined to find them. Every effort was going to be made to uh, capture and prosecute the people that were involved. After the abduction and murder of U.S. Customs Inspector Richard Latham, Investigators developed four suspects. One suspect, Rafael Calderon, was in jail. Another was dead, and two more were still at large. Six hours after Latham's body was recovered, the state police in Piedras Negras, Mexico, asked FBI agents to come to their office. Some of the customs inspector's personal effects had been discovered in a parking lot across the border from Eagle Pass, where his body was found. Included were Latham's wallet, a police-issued canister of mace, and several documents of interest to FBI Special Agent Don Weatherman. We also located two California Highway Patrol traffic citations, one listed to Rafael Calderon, the subject in custody, and the other listed to Carlos Pena. Less than 24 hours after the abduction, investigators had an ID on the fourth suspect. Carlos Pena was a Mexican native legally residing in the U.S. Investigators received his photo from the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Now they had to find Peña and his associate, Ricardo Cortez. It seemed that wouldn't take long. The next day, El Paso police received a tip that Cortez and Peña were hiding in an apartment in South El Paso. 
In minutes, an arrest plan was underway. The two-block area surrounding the apartment building was locked down. Coordinating units on the ground and in the air was FBI Special Agent Charles Riley. The streets were cordoned off in that area, and roadblocks were set up. U.S. Border Patrol helicopters were in the air looking on the rooftops, and officers were, were posted throughout the area while the, the search was conducted. The search for the fugitives was a sensitive mission. SWAT teams cleared the building apartment by apartment. It was dangerous work. The hallways were narrow and provided no cover if the two desperate men were to attack. Despite the thorough search, they came up empty. U.S. Customs Agent Dennis Harlan was undaunted. You can throw tons of manpower at a case like this, but you need some luck. And good luck is brought about by good, hard, aggressive police work. Then a new lead came when state police in Piedras Negras, Mexico, discovered a gray 1975 Pontiac Grand Prix abandoned in a nightclub parking lot. FBI agents crossed the border to search the car. But Mexican law prohibited a full-scale processing of the vehicle. We could not remove the vehicle and bring it back to the United States. We couldn't remove anything uh, except prints from the vehicle. The FBI agents photographed the car to document the items they could not collect and dusted for any latent prints. It was a surprisingly low-tech process, scotch tape and index cards. But it paid off. When the fingerprints were sent to the FBI lab in Washington. We determined that all four suspects that were identified had matching prints lifted from the vehicle. In El Paso, Texas, U.S. Customs agents continued their search for Ricardo Cortez and Carlos Pena. Six years. Six years. They learned Pena and the now dead suspect Jesus Ramirez had lived in the same apartment complex. They interviewed the apartment manager who identified the photo of Pena. She said she last saw him and Ramirez on the night before the Latham murder. The two were moving boxes from a gray Grand Prix into an apartment. A third man arrived, driving a blue car. From the agent's other photos, she identified him as Ricardo Cortez. She said the three men drove away that night in the Grand Prix, leaving the blue car in the lot. The manager got a call from Ricardo Cortez the next day, asking her not to tow the car. Either he or his mechanic would pick it up soon. That blue car was their best chance of getting to Cortez. Through the night and into the morning, agents maintained surveillance. Around noon, a man came and drove the car away. It was not Cortez or Pena. The agents followed. The man drove to a quiet part of town. He entered a bar. A few minutes later, he came back out alone and was stopped by the agents. 
Ask a few questions. Sure. The man admitted the car belonged to Ricardo Cortez. He said Cortez asked him to pick it up and meet him at the bar. But Cortez never showed, so he left the keys with the bartender. He said he didn't know where Cortez was staying. The agents verified his story with the bartender. He'd not seen Cortez either. While surveillance continued on the blue car, FBI agents located Cortez's girlfriend. What's going on? What's this all about? We think your daughter's boyfriend. Mama, no lo escuche. No es posible. Ricky nunca hiciera eso. Está mintiendo. They asked if she knew where Cortez was. She said that she had not seen or heard from him in over a week. This is very important. It's been over a week. I don't know. I'm here with you. But agents, even the woman's own mother, doubted her story. They asked the mother if they could install a tap and trace on her phone. With her consent, investigators could locate the source of all incoming calls. We needed to apprehend the other two suspects involved in the kidnapping of Richard Latham and his subsequent murder. So that's where the focus went from there. I mean, where in the hell are these guys, you know? All investigators could do was wait for Ricardo Cortez to call. The FBI, U.S. Customs Service, and other agencies were closing in on two remaining suspects in the murder of a U.S. Customs officer. Agents had contacted the girlfriend of one of the suspects, Ricardo Cortez, and were monitoring her telephone. Hello? Ricky? Where are you? Two days later, she received a call. Okay. Be careful. It was Cortez. Where was he at? He didn't tell her where he was, but agents traced the call to a motel in El Paso. Traced down the last call that was on this line. Special Agent Charles Riley was ready. Myself, other agents, uh, members of the El Paso Police Department and U.S. Customs proceeded to the motel. The SWAT team surrounded the building. Ricardo, come out of the hotel. Through the combined efforts of three law enforcement agencies, investigators accomplished their mission, according to Special Agent Don Weatherman. The El Paso Office of the FBI, Customs, and the police department there did a very good job Cortez was arrested with that motel. Eight days after Richard Latham's murder, Texas authorities had Ricardo Cortez in custody. A search of the room revealed no sign of suspect Carlos Pena. The driver of the Grand Prix, Ricardo Cortez, and Rafael Calderon were now in custody. Jesus Ramirez had killed himself at the traffic stop, but Carlos Pena was still at large. Yeah, I was involved. When questioned about the murder, Cortez gave a different account from that of the first suspect interviewed, Rafael Calderon. Cortez agreed that after they kidnapped Latham, Ramirez and Calderon led the inspector into the ditch. But Cortez said the fatal shots were fired not by Ramirez, but by Rafael Calderon. After the traffic stop by the Texas State Troopers and Ramirez committed suicide, Calderon saw an opportunity to blame his dead associate. When Cortez stated that it was in fact Calderon who had shot Inspector Latham, this was somewhat of a surprise. Cortez said that after the four split up, he and Peña abandoned the car and took a bus to Juarez, Mexico. Cortez advised that 
Pena was still in Juarez and had not uh, come over to El Paso. The FBI realized that they could not arrest him on their own. One of the other agents that I was working with contacted the Mexican authorities and provided them with the background information on Pena, and they started looking for Pena in Juarez. The U.S. Customs Service offered Mexican police a reward in exchange for information leading to Pena's arrest. Police in Juarez made sure Pena's friends and relatives understood that authorities would not leave any of them alone until the fugitive surrendered. Two days later, the tactic proved successful. Pena contacted the El Paso FBI office and advised that he wanted to turn himself in. Arrangements were made with him to meet at the top of the Santa Fe Bridge. Uh, the top of the bridge is the border between Mexico and the United States, and there's a marker there. We are not allowed to proceed into to Mexico for any interviews or any apprehensions. So by meeting him at the top of the bridge, we asked him to step across into the United States, which he did, and we took him into custody. The manhunt was over. The investigators took Carlos Pena to the El Paso port of entry. When questioned, his story matched that of Cortez down to the slightest detail. FBI Special Agent Don Weatherman. In my mind, the arrest of Carlos Pena pretty much summarized and concluded the investigation as to who was responsible for Richard Latham's murder. Their story was so consistent, um, I'm convinced that Calderon was the shooter and not uh, the deceased Jesse Ramirez. In San Antonio, a federal grand jury indicted Calderon, Cortez, and Pena on six counts. In exchange for his cooperation, Ricardo Cortez was allowed to plead guilty to conspiracy and assault on a federal officer. Carlos Pena pled guilty to the same charges. They were also convicted of state kidnapping charges and each received 23 years. Rafael Calderon, the man who killed Richard Latham, was charged with assault and murder of a federal officer. He pled guilty and was sentenced to life in prison. No one had been able to stop the men from taking U.S. Customs Inspector Richard Latham's life. But his peers, his friends, made sure the killers paid the price. Customs Service Special Agent Dennis Harlan. When anybody is murdered, it's serious business. But when an officer serves the country and protects the people, when he's, he or she is murdered, there's, uh, there's something that happens within law enforcement that's very, very positive. Nobody cares about who gets credit. Everybody is interested in capturing those who were involved and seeing that justice is done. Memorial services for Richard Latham were held at the Del Rio port of entry on January 31, 1984, at 2 p.m. At 2.30, U.S. Customs officers in every port of entry in the country observed a moment of silence out of deep respect for their fallen friend. Mm -hmm. 